In today's episode, we go over some new cubes that have been released, one of them from Diane, I answer a bunch of questions, and go over some history on Rubik's Cube legal issues. <laughs> Hey, Shani from SpeedCubeReview.com. This is the SpeedCubeReview Podcast Episode 12. Felix was on last week. Thank you very much for him being on. It was, it was a ton of fun. If you haven't seen that one, go check that one out. This time, I do not have a guest. I apologize. That's mainly the fault of me not asking people soon enough and also other people just being busy. I'm going to put the blame on myself, though I'm not blaming them for being busy. So today we're going to answer a bunch of questions. There was a ton of them sent in. Thank you very much. The winner of the giveaway for the GAN Air Masters already received this email. It is Mason. Thank you very much for entering. Now, there was a lot of entries, but when I checked those out, a lot of them were the same people. There was actually somebody who entered over 900 times. They created separate email addresses from some sort of disposable email website where you can just make a bunch of them. And and entered a couple times one day, but like from 4 a.m. to 9 p.m. a different day. I don't know if there's a bot doing it or if that person did it. And if that person spent that much time entering, well done on that, but you, you've been disqualified. So you can only enter once. Don't try to cheat the system. It's easy to find those things out. So don't, don't do that. I mean, that over 900 entries is impressive, but yeah, don't do that. You've been disqualified. <laughs> So for this week, I actually have an extra one of the Cubing Classroom uh, Master Morphics. I bought one before I knew I was going to get one in. So the one that I bought is still in the package and the box is a little bit uh, not so box shaped just because the Master Morphics is not really box shaped or cube shaped. So it's a little bit uh, crushed there, but the cube is fine. So I'm going to send that out. Um, same sort of thing when the podcast is done. Go to speedcubeview.com slash podcast and you can enter the giveaway that way. There'll be a question to enter. The answer to the question for this last one was what sport does Felix watch? It was Australian rules football, which actually I've never seen. So I'm kind of curious if what that's even like. Now, there was no new world record that I could see, so maybe I'm missing something, but I'm just going to go right on to some new puzzles. The Valk Mini has officially been shown and announced, and I am super pumped for this. It's, I believe it's going to be uh, 4.74 centimeters, which is actually kind of small. The Cubing Classroom 50 millimeter one is already pretty small, um, supposed to be a good travel one. Maybe good for one-handed. I actually am really loving using the 50 millimeter one for two-hand. I think I've set my new record for pretty much all my averages with that. I use it for blind. I use it for two-handed and one-handed. Um, so I'll check this one out. I might be getting it Wednesday. I, I'm getting something from China on Wednesday. I don't know what it is. Um, it might be that. It might be. It might actually be a Yuxia Pro. I don't know for sure. But when it comes in, I'm definitely going to do a video on it. I'm also going to try to magnetize it. So what I'm going to do is I think I'm just going to do actually a live stream of me magnetizing it. You don't really need to see a whole video on that. I've made one on the Valk, but um, just kind of trying to find excuses to, <laughs> to do live streams. So I'll do that. I'll magnetize it live. And then also I'll just answer questions while I'm on there. April's probably not going to be there to help do that. So it's not going to be as, as much flow as as moving as some of the other live streams have been. But that's my plan. If I can't magnetize, if it's not set up where you could, which I don't know why they wouldn't do that, um, I'm definitely gonna magnetize another cubing classroom. So whenever the uh, stickless one comes in, whenever I get that, I'm going to do that instead if the Volk isn't there. I'm gonna magnetize both anyways, I guess. So, oh yeah, so that came out. Um, there's also a Guanlong Pro or a Guanlong Plus, I've also seen it called Enhanced Edition, and a Guan Po Plus. So those are, I guess, nicer versions or better versions of the 3x3 and 2x2. Now, the 2x2, I, in my mind, was just not good. Um, I, I've never had a puzzle that where the caps just like popped off so easily. The performance, I guess, is okay, but it just it, it needed to be redone a little bit, more like how the Upo, I guess, is. For the Guanlong, I don't know what this is going to be like. Um, it definitely has squared off corners, but I don't, I've never seen the internal, so I, I'm just making assumptions here. I don't think it's going to be like the MF3RS. I'm thinking it's going to be like a, maybe a Guanlong with squared off corners. Um, but 
we'll see. I've already ordered it, and I think it shipped out today. Usually takes a couple days. So actually, I might have that on Wednesday as well, which is when this will come out. So expect those videos, I guess, that evening, or this evening if you're watching this, or maybe by the end of the week. I am, I have a big DJ gig coming up this weekend, so I'm actually going to be leaving town and staying for a couple nights in another place. So I'm not going to really be doing anything over the weekend. If anything, I'll have some videos release, you know, on Friday night or Saturday or Sunday, just so it's not all drop at once. We'll see how that goes, but... I probably won't be responding with too much because I will be quite busy this weekend. There is a new Cubing Classroom Megaminx. It looks like the Yoohoo. I don't know how it's going to perform. I'm going to assume it's not the same thing as the Yoohoo um, or the the Guanhu. I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, or I'm guessing it's not going to be like the Yoohoo R either. So more you. Long story short, if you don't know, Moyu was a branch off of YJ. YJ wasn't a branch off Moyu. Moyu was a branch off of YJ, and people get kind of confused with that because they think, you know, Moyu often has better performing puzzles, so they think that's got to be higher up. But no, it was a branch off of there, and they're not the same company anymore. There's probably some legal thing where they still have the same similar designs. They can use certain ones because definitely the MF3 is a Guanlong with, you know, just slightly different pieces with more tracks. So I'm assuming it'll be similar, just slightly altered. I don't know. It's a really confusing situation. I'm not going to go into all the details that I know right now, but we'll see what that is like. The last cube that came out, though, that I'm re everyone's surprised with is a Dian Zanchi version 2. <laughs> the last, the Zanchi came out almost five years ago, about four and a half years ago when it was released. And... Besides, you know, the the sixth one, is that the Panji? You have not heard anything from Diane. And suddenly, besides making like gem cubes and other weird things. So, I don't know what this is going to be like. Oh, yeah, so it's been almost five years and the corners are squared off. The corners look kind of nice. They look like maybe a GTS. The edges look the exact same. I They, they look practically the same. They even have... The torpedo shaped torpedoes, which is, you know, <laughs> people don't put torpedo shaped torpedoes anymore because a flat one tends to actually work better to lock a cube, lock the pieces in. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, when I'm able to order that, I will get that in and we'll find out. Um, so far, everyone online has had kind of eh, mixed reviews. I don't think anyone has been jumping to it's going to be amazing. Everyone's kind of like, I've had some people say that's going to be like, it's going to be horrible and pop a lot. No, seriously, relax a little bit. Like, let's not use extreme terms of saying it's going to be completely like this or completely like this. That's kind of one of the biggest things um, I get frustrated with in the community when we use these uh, these extreme terms of it's the best or the worst or pops all the time or locks all the time or, you know, it's the super slow... They, they all are pretty similar, but anyways, I'm going off on a tangent, which probably isn't a bad thing in a podcast, but anyways, so what I'm going to do is answer questions. There was a ton of questions sent in. Um, I'm not going to get to all of them. Some of them are were just actually private messages that weren't supposed to be read on air. Some of them are just ones that I don't really have a good answer to. So I actually haven't planned answers. I just went through ones that I feel like could work, but I'm going to start off with Matej from Slovakia, and hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Do you think there should be a special recognition for FWR, something like female national record, FCR, FWR? So basically asking, should there be a separate category for female cubers as opposed to, to male cubers? Honestly, I'm not the best person to ask. I think you should ask female cubers. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was hoping to have someone on the show today that I'd be able to ask that too. But um, I don't know. I don't think think so because it's not in the same realm as other sports but it's uh, it's hard to say I'm not going to be I'm, I can't answer this honestly I'm not the person to ask this if a bunch of female cubers preferred that there be a separate category for female cubers awesome then I guess we'll go with that but but yeah that's I can't answer it so maybe I probably shouldn't have put this question in here anyways so okay I'm gonna keep going on uh, Reggie from London. Um, it starts off with a lovely compliment, so thank you very much. Um, and so the rest of the question is, 
Do you practice in public and what is your opinion of this? I get bored when traveling to work on the train, so what I do is practice my uh, Rubik's Cube. This adds up to about three to four hours a week of practice. It was strange to start off, but now I've gotten used to it. I don't mind um, if you answer this on the show. Well, I am, thanks. Uh, keep up the good work. Cheers, Reggie. Thank you very much. Um, so as far as cubing in public, I don't like doing it. I've gotten more relaxed with it, but usually when I'm in public, I'm afraid of making noise. I mean, cubes aren't that loud, but they're loud enough to where I feel like it could be distracting for some people that get really, um, you know, sensory overload, can get annoyed by that kind of thing. And also, I, when I'm cubing, I like to be focused. And when people are staring at me, I can't focus on that. So when I'm at work, I usually, you know, shut my studio door and do that. But um, just recently, I went to it was just some park and I wanted to relax a little bit. So I just got a cube. I used my mini cubing classroom because it's actually kind of a quiet puzzle. And I just cubed for like a good hour or two and just sat there and did that over and over. I was, work I was working on C-O-L-L -L algorithms. And yeah, people came up and said stuff, but it, it wasn't bad. So I'm, depends on the situation. I honestly, I don't like it. I cube for myself, so I'd rather just do that. I guess, depending on what the situation is, if I don't feel like there'll be a bunch of eyes on me or with the smaller cube, it's not as bad um, because it, it's not this giant thing. I think if I was solving like like two by two, I'm not as, as not bad. When it's like four by four or five by five, I really don't want to do that in public. Um, if it's something like a shape mod, like a master morphix, that might actually not be bad because it's just turning slowly. I'm not doing really fast like stuff that could be annoying for someone. So, okay, I'm going to keep going on. We've got, there's a lot of questions. So this whole podcast is basically going to be questions until I get to the Rubik's Cube thing at the end. Um, so we have Juan from Buenos Aires. If you could design and name a speed cube, what would it be called? I've thought about this a lot. I've thought also about, because um, I used to play a lot of disc golf, if I came up with a disc company. And it's kind of the same thing. So I would either just do numbers, like the version one, version two, version three, and not try to come up with some crazy name that is like the Unicorn King. Like I, <laughs> I want to be taken seriously. I mean, my my thought is also making just like two versions or three that's like a more stable or more flexible one. And then I actually I talked about this in the podcast with um Convinsa, and that you know you would pick your springs, you would pick your um stickers, and then it would all come to you. So you would it, it would be a lot of designing how your own puzzle is and it'd be like a you know super version that has everything and so it'd just be a number basis one or letters ones that are that seem more professional if i did come up with names with it i feel like i know something like the planets or greek gods something like that where if it was like planets so the two by two is the venus the three by three is earth or probably some other you know latin version of it it was another name for earth because earth just i don't know I want to get something that sounds cooler. <laughs> um, I don't know. It'd be weird when you get to the 7x7, seven seven, though. So I'll, maybe that wouldn't be a good idea. Anyways, I keep going on. So uh, is it Ramon from the U.S.? If you got a fluke world record, what would your reaction be? Now, I talked about this in the Del Sony podcast. And we were talking about people getting world records that are kind of fluke ones. And my response was, I don't think that's really possible. I mean, the closest you could really get is a two by two because you could have like a form of solution. But even that, you need to be able to recognize it. You need to be able to react to it. Like you can't solve in four moves and be like, whoa, this cube is solved. I should stop the timer. It's already too late. So you have to have that experience. And then it's also turns per second. And so what um, I said in the Sony podcast was something like I... On an average solve, I'm a little under five seconds. On a good solve, I've been around six, but um, let's say a five second turn, five five turns per second, not five seconds, five turns per second, that if a an amazing solve is only like 30 moves, which is really, really good. Like, actually, I, I don't know, I can't think of, a, of an official solve that was under 30 moves, but that's still a six second solve. That's nowhere near the world record. It would have to be like a 20 move solution, which I possible well <laughs> i'm not gonna say it's impossible but so i really don't think that it's even would be a thing at most it would be a fewest moves and i would get like a last layer skip um or something where i am on the last you know 
last pair to put in or something like that and I can throw in a commutator. But even at that point, knowing block building, knowing, um, I guess, commutators, insertions, things like that, it all comes into play. And if it's an easy enough solution where I can figure it out, there'd be other people that, that would get it as well. So um, I'll just throw that out the window. But also, I guess what my reaction would be, if it's fewest moves, I, I would smile. That would be a, a reaction. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, for fewest moves, I'd have to, I'm not allowed, you know, you can't just make a lot of noise. So I would, I would smile. That's what I would do. I'd give a thumbs up maybe to someone. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Let's go on. Uh, oh, I, I think I it autocorrected the name. It says Say from India. And I know I didn't type Say, I don't think. But anyways, maybe it is Say from India. Uh, Till now, how many competitions have you won? Now, I think people get a little confused by competitions. Pretty much no one goes to a competition to try to win it. Um, that... Like, unless you are one of the top people in the world or, or you know all the people at the competition, you're going there to have fun. It's a community organizing thing. And um, pretty much every competition I've been to, there's been, there's been like Blake Thompson, Chris Olson was at the last one I was at. Um, people who have been cubing for a long time and just are really good. I mean, I've been cubing for a few years, which really is not that, that long compared to a lot of other people. And so I don't go to win. Most people don't go to win, and I'll answer that I have never won a competition, and I don't plan ever to win a competition. So if you're going to a competition and you're going to win, you might be really frustrated by the end of it because it, the whole point of it is to have fun. And you know, you if let's say you're going for three by three, you have five solves really. Even if you get to the final round, you have five solves. And if you've ever practiced three by three. You know that you could have five solves that are amazing, five solves that are eh, and a lot of it is just that moment what it's going to be. So yeah, so long answer short, I've never won a competition. I don't plan on winning a competition. So someone from Georgia, they gave me an alias for name. I, I'd like to make sure people are using their real name. Um, so I'm going to say alias with it. Uh, what was my first speed cube? What method do I use to solve 3x3? And when did I achieve sub 20? So my first speed cube... Um, I mean, I got a Rubik's Cube. I guess people wouldn't consider that a speed cube. So the Shangshu Aurora and the um, Fengshi Shuang Ren. And uh, what method do I use? I mainly use CFOP. I I did actually a few Rue solves yesterday. Just Rue is so much fun to do. If you've never done it, go into it. It's just, it's a lot of fun to do those M slices and edge orientation. Block building is a lot of stuff you can do with it. But when did I achieve sub-20? I would say, you know, where people talk about the sub-20 average. And I don't... I I remember saying something on the forum back, I think, about half a year into it. It's weird. I didn't I didn't really get into speed solving it until, um, you know, a few years after I learned how to do it. I was just solving for fun. Being like, hey, I'm getting a little bit faster. But I never thought about speed solving. And I don't honestly like answering this question anyways because everyone's different. There's been people who have been cubing for years who never get sub-20. Some people like Max Park who said he was sub-20 after a couple months. Um, it's it's not something that I like to answer because what usually people do then is they compare themselves. If it's not intentional, you know, they're thinking, well, what am I doing wrong if I'm not solving in that time? Or or I'm, I got faster than so-and-so in a short amount of time. Everyone's different and really... This is everyone, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I want to, everyone, you know, the amount that they progress is different. And what they progress in is also very different. Some people might not be as fast, but they might learn more algorithms and they might know more more technique on the cube. Um, some people might, might not be as fast, but they are able to do and solve the cube more efficiently, more, uh, less rotations, doing things that are just, um, more fluid. There's, there's all these things about it that, that it's not just a time-based thing. Yeah, competitions it is, but since I'm cubing for fun, and I think a lot of other people are, like, I stopped trying to get faster about a year ago, and I started just doing other stuff. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, of course, everyone would like to get faster, but it just going for getting a certain time, like if let's say your goal is to be sub 20, 
And then I have to get sub-20 goals to be like under that, maybe sub-15, then sub-10. And honestly, it gets more and more frustrating because it gets harder and harder to reach those times. So my response, although I did tell you the answer, is don't worry about that. Don't ask people that. Don't care about that. Just have fun. Dylan from Michigan asks, do you think cubing has helped in other aspects of your life, such as memorization, tracking certain objects, being intuitive in certain situations? Yes. I actually, my, um, uh, what was the video on? It was, it was on how to practice. If I tips on practicing and I use the violin for an example. So it's definitely helped with that. And that's the most thing, that's the biggest thing I think is obvious for me. It's probably helped in other things too, but that five tips for practicing was a big one that I talked about that. Zane from Georgia. How many algorithms have you learned? I have no idea. It's over a hundred at this point. Um, and it, it depends on what you're considering algorithms because I don't consider any F2L really as an algorithm. Um, maybe a couple, but most of it's intuitive. So if including that, and then if you include the mirror and the inverse, which would be on the left side and the back, you could then like say there's, you know, hundreds just from there. But I don't know, I don't keep track. It's it's just learning new things. And I'm gonna make a video of this at some point. Um, a lot of people, they learn OLL and then, or PLL, and they say, okay, what do I learn next? And they, for me, after I, I learned a lot of PLL and OLL, and probably even before I finished it, I started learning other PLLs and OLLs. I have changed the PLL that I use for sure for my end perms. Um, I almost changed it a third time. I, um, for the H OLL case, I don't know exactly what that's um, called, but I learned one version, then I learned a different version. Turns out they were different COLLs, so I f ended up learning those just on the spot. Um, there's other, and when I'm saying H, I was talking about like the H COLL. So there's also the H shape, which I've learned multiple ones of that. And the first one I learned was like a pure flip version of it, which is, has worked out great for other situations. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of rambling now as far as which ones I've learned, because just check out, like if you know, let's say full PLL, see which ones Felix uses, see which one Drew Brads uses, see which, which ones um, uh, Matt's Volk uses. Sometimes they're listed. Sometimes you can find them on their own YouTube pages. Other times, if you Google search what uh, PLLs or OLLs does such and such use, you can see it. I mean, Felix basically has all of them listed at Cube Skills, but even just going to uh, the speed solving wiki and seeing which ones there are for a parody algorithm, I kind of taught myself one from there that I didn't see anywhere else. I tried a few of them and I was like, oh, I like this one. Um, or one thing actually, the algorithm I use for, it's one of the dot cases. It's the one where there's a full bar on back. And actually I'll just set it up if you are watching this on YouTube. Um, the one that I use I haven't seen anyone else use, and actually it wasn't even on the speed solving wiki. There was something that was similar to it, and so I took that and adapted it for myself for what I think would like finger trick the most, the easiest. And I have it listed, but I mean, basically I'll just show you right here. What I do for the movements of it, I, I feel like flows really well, and I'm able to just do it without having to regrip or do anything weird. So anyways, I'm, I'm going off topic on algorithms. But long story short, I guess is I don't know. Um, so let's keep going on. Oh, so we have Sahaf from India. Did anyone tell you before that you look exactly like Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory? Never gotten that one before, actually. Um, what I get a lot is James Marsden. I used to uh, teach in schools a lot, and at least once a week someone would say that, and I still don't see it. And uh, fun story, I, <laughs> I was at um, I was at Taco Bell and getting some dinner. And the person behind the counter was like, you look like this guy from the movies. And I was like, James Marsden. She's like, yeah. I was like, no, I don't. And so I finally was like, we're going to settle this. And so I went on Facebook and I made a post, you know, do I look like James Marsden? And everyone, like no one said no. Everyone was like, yeah, you do. And even my aunt was like, I've been telling everyone this all the time everywhere. I guess, I don't know. I still don't see it, but that's what I get the most. Okay. Uh, Diane from Vancouver, what was your very first 2x2 and what was your best time in 4x4 when you first solved it? 2x2, um, two two, I, I got a Diane. I looked up, I wanted a quiet puzzle and that was what everyone said was the quietest one. And it was an original plastic. I didn't even know anything about original plastic and new plastic. Um, quick thing about the original new plastic, Cubella just did a thing on that, kind of trying to tour them out. And 
they kind of feel the same, you know, after you lube them and tension them, they perform the same. So for people that, that want to try dye in two by two, but are like trying to find an old plastic, don't worry about it. Just, just get a new plastic one. The other thing as far as four by four, I don't know what time it was when I first solved it. I don't, whenever I get a new puzzle, I don't usually time myself. I'm just trying to learn how to do it. And, um, I don't know what the slowest time was whenever I first timed myself. Um, but then again, like I said, the time as far as solving is not super important to me. Um, it's about learning new things. And so like I do Hoya because it's fun. There are people like, like I didn't even realize Keaton Ellis does Hoya and um, has a couple solves that are like in the 20, mid 20s as far as solving it. So it can be fast, can be under 30 seconds. I feel like it could be under 20 seconds even just with, you know, different people practicing it and using it, but it's fun. So yeah, I don't know what my time is for that. Paul Roberts from Alabama asks, I have mixed opinions about magnets and 2x2. Some parts of me feel like it's too fast of an event to make a difference. Other parts of me feel like the little bit of a click into place can help prevent lockups and make an elk smoother. What do you think about magnets and 2x2? All the 2x2s that I um, have that I use are magnetic now. Um, I've got a magnetic uh, Gorgon Jinghen. I've got a magnetic Kung Fu. I've got a magnetic, I've got two magnetic Wei Po's. Um, I've got, what else? There's a couple of the magnetic ones, a Chu Wen, magnetic Chu Wen. Um, there's something I did recently. Oh, the, uh, magnetic Chi calves, Chi Yi. Oh, I almost forgot. Chi is coming up with a new, uh, two by two. The Wu something, Wu Shen. Uh, but anyways, they actually posted both on, both on Instagram and Facebook what internals you prefer. If it, it looks like there's caps on the pieces, actually. But um, it was either black or primary. I like the black one. Primary looks cool, but honestly, I prefer black ones. Um, on the on the Thunderclap 4x4, the mini had white internals. Those do not those do not look like primary. Um, no, the full size had white internals, and the mini had black. Where's my mini one? It's somewhere. So <laughs> they asked about that because that will be coming out some point i don't know there's no release date um but that one hopefully i'll be able to make magnetic as well i like magnets in puzzles i'm not fast enough on two by two like i have some solves at home that are under a second but my fastest the competition is like five seconds just because like i said with something else you, you with one of the other questions you get five solves that's it and for two by two it nerves can really take over because there's so few moves to solve it um, and then you feel like you can do it super fast and then it gets all clunky. I don't really think magnets prevent lockups that much at all. Um, you know, you're still controlling and it doesn't automatically click itself in place like the tips of the, of the chi bell or the X-Man bell. Maybe if you're solving like a second and a half average, then the magnets might make a difference for you or not. But at that speed, little, you know, fraction of a second really make a big difference. So again, I'm kind of rambling on it, but I like magnets. I just like that click feel of it. Adriel from Massachusetts. Have you had any problems with paint stiffness from cubing? I had a fairly major case once soon after I got into cubing and my times dropped for a while because of it. And also um, Jisoo from Massachusetts as well. And a lot of questions from Massachusetts. How can these things be avoided? Um, is there even a proper form or technique to cubing? I, for something like, we talked about this a little bit, I talked to Felix about this at the last podcast, repetitive strain injury, it's not really something that correct form can be avoided because it's a constant movement over and over that's wearing out um, your joints and your tendons, and as as long as, you, you know, even if you have your hands more relaxed, it's still going to be an issue. Um, I actually think for myself, I'm getting some arthritis in my right hand, um, maybe a little bit in my left as well. And I can feel it more in my pinky because I think for one handed, my ring finger actually for one handed because I do a little more ring finger than pinky. So I, I'm getting some, some pain and actually the last competition, I brought some, um, some pain medicine and some stuff to put on my hands to hopefully do a little pain relief. There is like, um, some like menthol cooling gel and actually i didn't really need it at the competition my hands were okay then so we'll see hopefully it doesn't get worse if it does you know i'll be focusing more on fmc and maybe blind because i'm not too worried about speed although i did get my first sub minute 30 solve in blind which i'm excited about hopefully i can do that at a competition or something 
Um, so yeah, so I don't think proper like technique will help. Definitely if you're doing some weird stuff with your hands, like uh, back in the day for old Rubik's Cube, there's the Rubik's Thumb where it was, you know, they were trying to turn the cube a lot with their thumb and, and that was causing some injuries. Since the cubes are lighter, um, one of the things that it might be beneficial to use something like a GAN uh, Air Ultimate because since it is lighter, it might be easier to turn. So there's ways around it using stuff like that and just using faster, lighter puzzles and turning smaller or slower turns. Alexander from Australia. Hey Sean, I want to know what the hardest step in your opinion is to accomplish when trying to get sub one on four by four. It's hard to say too, because I've, I've kind of never really timed each step, but I feel like edge pairing is where things can really fall off. Um, there's a lot of ways to be excessive in edge pairing on four by four. And like I, so I, the cross is already solved. I'm going to put a cube out. So if you listen to the podcast, you'll hear some cube sounds. I use Hoya for um, four by four. And because of that, the cross edges are already solved. Whenever I'm, I finish solving, the cross is already done and I don't have to worry about that. So I have eight edges left. And then I also like solving six two. And so if um, I already have like, if it's a, a good one, I can solve all the edge pairs with really few movements because I would only need six. Those last two then are a fun little edge flipping thing. So like this example right here, let's see here. So in this case, I would have um, one, two, three. Oh, this is a bad case of this because I've got those crossed there. But I'll keep doing that. Four, five, six, and then I slice and then bring that one back up and down. Um, I lost count. <laughs> I should have kept counting. And then I slice back. And then I just have three to go. So all I have to do now is, wait, nope, what am I doing? What is going on there? Oh, this is really weird. My eyes couldn't handle this. Um, I've got orange and yellow edge, green and yellow edge, and green and orange edge left, and my eyes were just not understanding what was going on. So what I can do then, put that down, slice over, and then replace it and slice back. Um, so that was a weird one. Don't, don't, <laughs> I, I probably would have had to pause a lot trying to figure that one out. But there's ways you can pair multiple things at once. More people do three, two, three. Um, I like six, two, just cause I like to get those all out of the way. Sometimes I do three, two, three. Um, I'll notice that there's already a bunch of edges paired and it's just a lot easier to do that one. So that's kind of the hardest thing, or uh, not the hardest thing, the most, one of the most important steps to make sure you're efficient with. So I'm gonna keep going on. We have Justine or Justin from the Philippines. I I don't know. It, it would be Justine in the U.S. Um, for you, even if you're not doing OH a lot, what is the best speed cube for OH and why? There is no best cube for OH. I like the cubing classroom one. If you like smaller cubes and you want 50 millimeter, cubing classroom, of course, um, right now has um, some of the best corner cutting a corner twist actually a lot. Uh, it's a puzzle, even though I squared off corners, it's easy to corner twist. We'll see how the Valk is. It's a little bit, might be a little bit smaller, but it might work out really well. But like Felix for, um, I think for the world record, uh, he might've still been using the Moyu Aolong version one. If not, it's the GAN Air. I can't remember. He used the, the Aolong version one still a little bit for one-handed even after he switched to the GAN for two-handed. But that's a full-size puzzle, and I do not work well with the full-size puzzle with one-handed. So there's no best. What I suggest when people are getting into one-handed, start with a small puzzle because that's kind of the biggest thing. The hurdle is muscle development. It's not so much learning new algorithms, learning special one-handed algorithms. It's muscle development. So starting with something like even the 42 millimeter um, Zanchi, and then going to a 50 millimeter puzzle, then trying a 55 millimeter puzzle. I used the mini Aolong for a while, and that's a version one, two. They don't never made a version two of the mini Aolong, but I really liked that because it wasn't super small, but wasn't as big as a full size puzzle. Sai from Massachusetts, another one from Massachusetts. Um, I think you should try to do more challenge videos. For example, one that I haven't seen anyone try before solving a cube with only being able to see it through a mirror. Uh, Red KB, I think, did that exact thing. So I don't have any plans of doing that. Um, it just doesn't interest me. I know other people do that, but the videos I make, I do because they're what I want to do. <laughs> and yeah, I'm not interested in doing 
challenges or things like that. Um, and it's also, I don't do race videos where I like race someone else. And I've had a lot of people, a lot of people ask me to do those, be like, hey, can you come to my channel, do a, do a Let's Race video? I don't do any of those because like I said, I don't cube to compete with other people or get faster than them. And even if it's friendly competition, it's still more competition that I'd like to, to do when I cube. So um, yeah, I just, no plan on doing that at all. And so now we have a name that I cannot pronounce from India. Do you think there'll be any element used in a cube to make it better other than boron? I don't think boron makes a cube better. Um, it makes magnets fall off, but <laughs> it doesn't make a cube better. And actually, th this request was probably submitted right before uh, Chris Tran showed. I forgot what element it was that he, he mixed with the plastic. But it, I've, even before, like, like two... Two years ago, before any, all these crazy, uh, you know, things came about, I was talking to a parent of one of my violin students, and he was talking about sort of self-lubricating plastics, which is interesting. The first time I heard about it, now I've heard uh, Chris talk about it too, and only if I, I said it first. Um, but the there's different things that might work as far as plastic to change the feeling, but nothing that I going to make it better. I mean, at this point, a lot more people, I think, are slowing down the puzzles than trying to speed them up. And actually, that's one thing. If you are starting out, getting a faster puzzle doesn't make you a faster solver, and a lot of people are slowing their puzzles down to make them more controllable. Even some of the fastest solvers in the world do that. Um, so I don't really think that that is going to be a big thing. And even if they use plastics that are kind of self-lubricating or really fast, um, people like to lubricate the puzzles differently. Which, another question, I don't think anyone's asked this on here, but about like what lubrication is best for a certain puzzle. There is no best. It's whatever you want. Um, so as far as the material used, I don't think it can get much better. The only thing it could be is maybe making it stronger um, because if a piece is thin enough, they, they do tend to break. So maybe you're finding a way to making that a little bit stronger. And uh, another person, I think they just give an alias from the U.S. How do you pronounce Yushin? Uh, I've been told it's pronounced Yushin. It's not Yuxin. Um, but if you pronounce Yuxin, it's not bad. It's kind of like um, like any of the any of the pronunciations. People try their best with it. Shengshou. Uh, let's use that as an example real quick too. So everyone, everyone, everyone said Shengshou, and then a pretty prominent cuber started calling it Shengshu. Someone who I considered to know much more than I do. So I was like, okay, it's Shang Shu. So I said Shang Shu for about a year. A lot of people on my videos were like laughing about it. And they were like, well, he doesn't know how to pronounce it. And I would usually comment back being like, well, that just might be the pronunciation. And now it seems that people who do actually speak Chinese or Mandarin, actually, I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, said it is Shang Shou. So, and I looked it up and it seems that it is Shang Shou. So I've been pronouncing it that. Some people still say Shang Shou and I'm not going to be like, hey, now I think it's supposed to be this. <laughs> so it's, however you want to pronounce it, as long as people know what you are saying, that's really it. Mark from the Netherlands. Do you think videos of walkthrough solves can be used as a better alternative to actual tutorial videos for learning how to solve certain cubes? For example, when I got my first 5x5, while I already was pretty good at 4x4, I learned how to solve it with JR Cuber's walkthrough solves because tutorials gave me all that extra information like the correct color scheme and notation and his walkthrough videos got straight to the point so I could see exactly how you're supposed to solve it instead of getting all this information I already know. I agree. I completely agree. Um, the problem is making videos to fit everyone. Um, at least, you know, a dozen times a week, I'll get some people saying, best video ever, thank you so much for making this, and other people going, this is the worst video ever, and some people going, you you talk too fast, I can't understand anything, and other people go, thank you for just getting to the point with it. I can't please everyone. Usually when people say I talk too fast, I say, you know, this is for reference, so you can, you can literally slow down the video. Actually, something kind of funny, slow down videos of people talking on YouTube, and it just sounds hilarious. But, um, yeah, you can always slow it down, pause it, rewatch. Um, I feel like if I talk too slow, other people would get really bored with it. Although I probably do talk too fast sometimes. So anyways, back end point. Um, I like walkthrough solves and actually a lot of videos like my Hoya 4x4, my Hoya 5x5, um, my M2 video for blind, I did a walkthrough solve after the tutorial for people to see that. And actually in my first, 
in my big, you know, how to solve a cube, I do a walkthrough solve at the end of that. I, a lot of people who write me and say, I'm still confused after watching a blind video, I, I tell them watch the walkthrough solve. So I agree. I, I think walkthroughs can be much more helpful or at least helpful for certain people looking for, or who already know what they're going through. And I hope that the tutorials I make kind of brush through some of that. Like when I talk about um, Yao, I don't go into anything else for reduction. I assume you know how to solve the cube with reduction already. So that's all the questions for today. Thank you very much for everyone who wrote in. If you want to write in, be on the show, um, go to speedcubeview.com slash podcast. There's a place to submit questions there. Um, if you didn't get on the show, I apologize. Some of the questions I just didn't feel like worked well or there were repeats. Um, somebody asked a couple times about doing a history on blind, and I've looked that up. I don't really know a good, um, you know, we could talk about Pachman. He, he's done a lot of different things and as far as progression on on um, different methods. Like, he came up with M2 and stuff like that. Did I already talk about that? That sounds really familiar. Anyways, I'm let me get back on track. So, um, okay, what I want to talk about as far as a cubing history thing, I, I've been on and off with that just because some things I think about for cubing history, I ended up, like, I want to do something on Zanchi today and Diane. And I started doing a lot of research and I realized it wasn't enough to really make a good video about this. So one thing I was thinking about though is Rubik's and their sort of lawsuits. Um, and what I mean by that is they, you know, Erno Rubik's designed this puzzle, but there's a lot of work to get it to where it is and a lot of protecting their own product. I would say 99% of the cubers out there use off-brand Rubik's Cubes, use different ones. And I kind of want to go into that because now with the working with uh, GAN, that's, that's a little bit interesting of what's going to happen next. Now, I gave myself a lot of notes, so if you're watching this and I'm looking a little bit off the camera, that's why I'm reading some stuff, some notes that I wrote. Uh, first off, I am not a lawyer, um, which makes a lot of the informa information out there either extremely confusing to read or... It's other non-lawyers spouting their opinions on things, which isn't really that much better at all. There is a page dedicated on the Rubik's Cube site about um, legal action lawsuits. Not their like legal page, but there, there should be a page on that. But when I went to it, there's nothing there. So either it's a wrong um, URL, or they didn't build it, or they've deleted it. But at least that part of the site is not there. So kind of starting out at the beginning of it, um, when Rubik applied for a patent for his magic cube in Hungary, uh, HU170062, which you can search at the Hungarian Intellectual Property Office, he didn't apply for an international patent. And that already kind of caused some issues because other people had come up with a similar idea around the exact same time. Um, I kind of talked about this in the history of Rubik's. It was in one of the older, one of the first podcasts. Actually, it might have been the first podcast. Anyways, go check that out. Um, so whenever you think about Rubik's, or more specifically Seven Towns, which is the toy company that um, Rubik's works through or, or works with, they're the ones that kind of bring the lawsuits. But it's not really a question about, um, you know, what I'm not asking today is, is should they be suing people? Because their business, they're protecting their own property. And even if other people are upset by it, you know, companies and people need to protect their intellectual property. And that's kind of why I make a big deal about people stealing other people's videos and using music that they don't own. Like if you post a video and post music you don't own, don't put, I do not claim to own property of this music. That doesn't make it legal. And even if you can get around it, like I know some, I'm going off on a tangent here. I know that um, some prominent cubers, although they're not that happy when people use their videos, they're not going to come after them. That doesn't mean that gives you the right to do it. Because as someone who can make content on YouTube and you know possibly even profit off someone else's work, even if you're not profiting, you're still taking away their possible profit or income from it. As a, it's still not good. <laughs> I wanna say not nice. It's still not something that we should do as a community. But let me get back on to this Rubik's thing. So, um, one big thing that, that people might remember is um, in the beginning of 2012, Diane was sent a notice about their color scheme. They were told their color scheme is infringing on Rubik's patent. And so there are different ways they try to get around this. One of them was they replaced orange with purple. 
and there we go. We're not copying your color scheme anymore. So if you ever see that, I actually have not seen a Dian cube with purple instead of orange, but if you ever see an old one, that might be why. Um, as far as beginning, um, or as far as the design being trademarked, it was registered in 1999 and then renewed again in 2006. Um, there's a competing toy company called Simba Toys that back in 2006, after they renewed it, they tried to get it repealed, claiming that the lines of a Rubik's Cube um, could not be trademarked because they were saying that the lines are part of the device itself, that it's not just an image, that it is part of, that it is part of the mechanism and you can't trademark um, a mechanism like that. And they actually lost. The Court of Justice of the European Union stated basically that the black lines do not specify uh, how the cube can move or even if it can move, it's just the lines on the image. And you only know that it can move if you already know the product, not if you're looking at it for the first time. In addition, the court found that the cubic grid structure of the mark diff um, of the mark differs significantly from other three-dimensional puzzles available on the market, and that structure therefore has distinctive character which enables consumers to identify the product uh, producer of the goods in respect to which the mark is registered. And this is where I'm, I'm going to come back to this in just a second because effectively the decision allows the Rubik's Cube brand to claim protective protection for any flat-sided cube with equally spaced orthogonal 3x3 grid, whatever surface decoration within the toy and game category. Um, and that's going to be important. The ortho um, orthogonal basically is like a 90 degree square grid. Um, a couple years ago, eBay took down a ton of, a ton of uh, eBay posts or products, a lot of them from Lubix too, that sold cubes um, into Europe. But it seems they've come down with that. I didn't look too much into that one. So the reason I wanted to bring up about, or the reason I, I want to go over this is not to bring up some heated debate. I'm not curious about, um, you know, what do you think? Do you think it's right for them to do this? But I'm kind of curious about the future of this. I don't know the exact relationship between Rubik's and the company Seven Towns, but with Gan now now being a developer of a branded Rubik's Cube, which is being sold in stores, at least online stores right now. I don't know if it's going to be in actual like brick and mortar stores, but um, what's going to happen to the current model? Are they going to sell those off and put these new, new ones in? Are the, you know, the seven towns version of the rubik's cube going to be sold there and this is kind of the big thing does the rubik's cube still represent a flat sided cube with equally spaced orthotical three by three grid i mean the tiles are square but the pieces are not so i've got i've got my rubik's cube here the tiles are square and I, from this distance it looks kind of like a square cube it doesn't look like a gan puzzle but when you look closer it's not and that kind of brings up debate of, of what a Rubik's Cube is anymore. Then again, it's a trademark image and not the actual puzzle itself. So that's that's also a whole different thing. So I'm not going to claim answers or no answers to what is going to be in the future. It, it seems that they're going a different direction of instead of trying to eliminate any competition, they're just going to kind of work with them. So like, if, you can't, if you can't beat them, join them. Maybe that's the, that's the answer, the moral of the story. Um, but um, I'm just really interested in the history of it. So whether the community likes that direction or not, that's a whole separate matter. But so that should do it for the podcast today. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to submit questions, please go to speedcubeview.com slash podcast. You can enter there. Just go to speedcubeview.com and there's the podcast tab on the top. I'm hopefully going to have a guest on at the next podcast. The next couple weeks are extremely busy. I just have to make sure I ask people before it gets too late. Um, if you'd like to enter the giveaway for the Master Morphics, please go again to speedcubeview.com slash podcast. The giveaway will go for about a week, and then once that week's done, I will get around to contacting the winner. I might not post things online, and if you ask me directly, I'm not going to answer that. Um, so just watch out for that. If anything, if I don't post it online, usually I'll say something in the next podcast. If you're listening to this on iTunes, please go and leave a review. It greatly helps the show out. It keeps me going. Somebody sent a nice message also in one of the questions I didn't read on air, but just thanking me for making the podcast. I appreciate that a lot. Right now, this takes more time than any of my videos, and I really need to do a lot more work to get it together. Now that I'm doing video as well, it's a lot more work. So thank you. It's it's fun for me to do, but knowing that people are actually sitting there and listening and, and they appreciate it makes me want to continue it. If you're on YouTube, hit like and subscribe, of course. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll talk to you guys next time.